Uh, hello, so um, my, name is, um, my name is Corentin Jabot, and uh, some people in the room are under the delusion that I know anything about C++. Uh, but today, I actually want to talk to you uh, about JavaScript. Um, so in JavaScript, uh, they have this tool called NPM. Uh, NPM stands for Node Packet Manager. Uh, but what it really means is JavaScript Packet Manager. What that means is that if you have been doing uh, any kind of JavaScript development in the past 10 years, you have used this tool. Uh, the website for CPP can probably use this tool. And if you have used a website, it probably uses this tool. Uh, so the way it works is you can fetch a package with the uh, node aptly named install command. And that will, for example, in, uh, fetch uh, the request package in your dependency folder. And um, you get uh, this uh, request package, uh, which may have a um, lot of dependency. In this case, uh, a few, uh, five or six level of nested dependencies. And in fact, in uh, the NPM ecosystem, there is over a thousand, uh, sorry, a million uh, dependencies, and people have been building tools to uh, visualize that ecosystem. Uh, of course, we cannot talk about NPM uh, without talking about the left pad incident, right? Uh, so left pad was a package to add padding to string. And for some reason that's not relevant, it was removed uh, from the package manager by, by its author. And as a result, internet broke. Um, that day, the, the uh, JS community learned a few lessons. Uh, first, uh, published dependencies should be immutable. People should not be able to remove a uh, dependency from a packet manager. And, and the second one is that you should probably uh, keep a copy and pin your dependencies. Um, unfortunately, we fixed internet. And, and so people got back online a few hours later and they, they, have, they had opinion, right? Because maybe programmer didn't know how to program because uh, what was this nonsense with left pad? Why was internet broken? What happened? Uh, of course, in the C++ community, we barely noticed, right? Uh, at best, we were amused. Uh, first off, we are super beings, right? Uh, maybe we are too busy working on a common line parser, the third of that week. And most importantly, uh, we know that leftpad is really implementable. Um, in fact, if you look at an implementation of leftpad, uh, you can see that that's a rotate, right? Uh, but let's talk about leftpad a bit more. Uh, so leftpad was uh, written by a junior developer. Uh, they, they wanted that piece of functionality, and they couldn't find it anywhere. It was not in the standard library. Uh, it was not in any library, uh, so they did write it. And they wrote that piece of code, right? And they decided to put it in a function. They give that function a name, put that function in a file. They probably wrote some test, and they shared that function with the world. So I'm pretty sure that people still know how to program. And ensure that implementation was not great and it was modified many times, but how long does it take you to write an implementation that is quite tested, efficient, and most importantly, reusable, right? So packet manager, right, because uh, NPM install takes few seconds. So packet manager are tools that uh, make it trivial to install code and dependencies. And the trivial part is important, right? You really want your tool to be frictionless, and, and that allows people to focus on the important part of their software, and that's how you make a thriving ecosystem. Maybe most importantly, you get more people contributing to your code because it's easy to actually get the source from your, your project, so you get more contributors. Of course, Packet Manager, uh, like all powerful tools, have, have some issue, right? Uh, so you have new issue with Packet Management, uh, so you cannot avoid micro packages. So micro packages are like very small packages. You cannot avoid that, right? And so if you think that's an issue that should be avoided at all cost, uh, the solution is to not have packet manager. And dependency is fundamentally about trust. Uh, if you don't trust uh, some dependency, don't use it. And of course, that trust has to expand transitively. So uh, the dependency you depend on also depend on something. And if you don't like that, don't use that dependency, right? Because maybe C++ developers are not super being. Maybe we just have terrible tools. Uh, so this is my talk, Dependency Management at the End of the Rainbow. Uh, of course, I need to explain the title. Um, 
y at the end of the rainbow. So this is not a pragmatic talk. I'm not a pragmatic person. Uh, in fact, I have a unicorn. Uh, everybody is going in one direction. The committee is going in one direction. The two writers are going in one direction. But nobody takes the, the, the passage travel. Uh, it looks nice. Uh, there is a rainbow. So, so let's go that way and, and see what happens. Right. So, so the goal is, is this tool is to answer, can we uh, make cargo in C++, right? Because um, the community wants that, right? Dependency management is something that is seen by Bjarne and a lot of other people as something important, right? Uh, and the community also wants uh, some, something that to deal with dependency, right? Uh, there have been a few surveys by the C++ Foundation and package is um, a hot topic, right? So a few disclaimers, this is not a talk about code because I know nothing about code. If you want a, a talk about code, uh, I advise you to watch uh, Titus's talk, which is really relevant to dependency management uh, at uh, the code level, right? Uh, and this is not a talk about tools. Uh, if you want to watch a talk about tools, I uh, notably recommend a talk from Robert Kumaker of VC Package, but there are also tool, uh, talk about CMake and, and Conan this week, so you can check that out. Uh, so this is not a talk about code, nor about tools, so I have nothing to talk about, right? Uh, but we have code. And when you write code, the um, consensus is that uh, tools don't exist, or tools are not reliable, or your users don't have tools, uh, so you cannot assume that tools exist. But of course, we also have tools. And when you write tools, the, the assumption is that uh, people will not modify their code, and so you have to deal with uh, 50 years old code, right? Uh, between code and tool, we have uh, the compilation model of C++, which is how you transform uh, your code into a program or how you analyze your code. All of that is the C++ ecosystem. Of course, you need to have people in there. So I think dependency management is a clue that tie all that together. So maybe we have to talk about everything. But let's start at the beginning. What's a dependency, right? Because I didn't say package, I said dependency. So why? And dependency is the stuff you, you need to make a program. I'm sure you are glad to be there, right? You, you learned something. Uh, but what's a C++ program? And it turns out that's a really complicated thing to define, right? Maybe program is a collection of libraries, right? That's how a lot of people see a, a C++ program. Maybe it's a collection of symbols, right? If you are a, a loader on your system, the loader thinks a program is a collection of symbols. What does the standard say? So a program is a collection of translation units, and um, translation units are, are made with source file and header files, right? So maybe a program is a collection of translation units. Library don't in fact exist, right? You can look in the standard, search for library, they don't exist, right? So we have translation units. But we need to talk about headers. Uh, headers are just like a piece of code that is copy-pasted in your, in your source file. Um, so they are not bonded. Uh, you cannot tie an implementation to its interface, so it's really hard for tools to uh, keep track of where everything is declared, everything is defined. So you cannot depend on later files. So fortunately, uh, in C++ 20, we added modules, and modules are translation units, right? So maybe a program is a collection of modules. As I said, this is not a pragmatic talk. Use modules. Uh, it might take you 10 years to get there, but you should uh, try to get there as soon as possible. And the advantage of module is that they are bonded. Uh, you know where the interface is. Uh, you have a consistent interface across all your programs, so you don't have ODR issues. And so modules are something that tools can track. So the standard also talk about translation unit in terms of collection of declaration and definition, right? And it's where the, the when definition rule is uh, defined. Uh, what does that mean? So let's say I want to use uh, some kind of socket, right? Uh, this is what I want to express in my program. Right, this is what I want. This is what I want to depend on. So I have this socket, and hopefully it's in a namespace, right? You should put your code in namespaces. And hopefully that namespace is uh, also in modules, uh, so your co code is uh, nicely isolated. And maybe you have uh, that module in translation unit, right? And at some point you will uh, 
compile that translation unit, maybe make a library, and maybe all of that is in a package. Problem with packages is at this point you already have compiled your code, so it's a completely black box. But you, not, you don't have only one dependency, right? You have many dependencies. And, and to make all of that work, you need build system. You need compiler. You need build system. You need, um, sorry, uh, you need meta build system because people do that. Uh, maybe you have meta meta build system. That's something that exists, right? Of course, if you have library, you need to involve some loader, so you have a prime at that level. You have packet manager to deal with package, and people have been written packet packet manager because that's a thing. And that, that is like, that doesn't work, right? At some point, it crumbles and uh, you have nothing that works, right? It's just too complicated to, to uh, scale, right? So uh, what's a C++ program? It's most, what you want it, it, is that a C++ program should be a collection of definition, right? But all of that is the same thing, right? You have dependency trees. So everything is a dependency graph of some kind, right? And the problem with graph is that they grow. And, and so you have like this um, exponential complexity. Even if you start with something simple and you have a few dependency at some level, uh, you get really quickly uh, a complexity that you cannot uh, hope to manage, right? Okay, let's talk about system libraries. So, so let's say you have a library foo on some system A, that's your development environment, and you are trying to develop some program and maybe you are deploying that on system B, right? So you have this library, and it's present on both systems, and it's called library foo. But is it the same, right? Is it compatible? What does compatible mean, right? Maybe it's some kind of virus, and you don't know, and uh, you are actually linking to a virus, and uh, the user will blame for you because it's uh, executed by your program. And maybe more importantly, how does that system evolve, right? Because the library on system V can change and you have absolutely no control over it, right? So if you use system provided library, uh, right, you are tied to the deployment platform, which means you have uh, to care about ABI, which means uh, you are tied to the platform compiler and you live at tail, right? This is not what you want. Uh, speaking of ABI, there was a great talk a few years ago uh, from Jack Magnellis. It was talking about DLL and when uh, talking about uh, C++ ABI, don't, right? Don't uh, rely on the Microsoft C++ ABI because they change it every few years and that's true of all systems, right? Uh, ABI and the stable, don't use them. So what you want to use is C. So I don't want that to be taken out of context, right? Uh, what I mean is uh, you want to have a C interface between different libraries, right? It doesn't actually matter that you use C. What you want to use is a clearly defined interface that is really as small as possible and you can uh, control, right? So you can use C, you can use COM, you can use Dbus, you can use some kind of custom IPC if you want, uh, but you, what you don't want is to have your C++ object uh, cross between that boundary. So shared library um, can be useful, right? They are used for shared library, but just don't share them. Right, so let's talk more about build system. Right, so one thing build system do is finding things, finding header, finding library, and for example, CMake will find something on your system to, to call what we call configure uh, your project. And, and CMake will do its best to find something on your system that match what you want. But when you ask CMake to find, for example, a boost rate package, what does that mean? Because if you look at uh, the boost rate documentation, they have like something like a 30 different configuration variable. So you have thousands of different boost rate that can be configured. And so when you find one, which is it? Is it what you want? You don't know. And that's a big difference uh, between C++ and, and uh, this other tool like NPM, Cargo, and Rust. Uh, Cargo does, where, does know where things are, and it does know what things are, right? So maybe dependence, dependency management is sharing a common understanding of names, right? And the only way to do that is take control over the, on the, on the, sorry, over the environment, be the environment. So to do that, you should build the world from source. 
this is really difficult. So aspire to, right? And you want to do that in a consistent environment. Right, uh, so have source dependencies, and be assertive about it. Don't try to have conditional dependency be because that really doesn't scale. Uh, don't try to uh, say, okay, if I have a Zlib, I will do that, otherwise I will do this. Uh, of course, don't depend on things you don't need because uh, that uh, can pose scalability issue. And so avoid using the system packet manager because the system packet manager is there for the benefit of your system, not for yours. So it's not meant to be for developer, right? Uh, more importantly, don't bundle your dependency. Uh, the best we have right now is VC package and Conan, so use uh, one of those, right? And it may sound crazy to say that we uh, should build everything from source, but uh, actually if you look at modern C++, everything uh, needs to be in source file, right? Everything wants to be in interface, whether that template general programming concept or the compiler, the compiler needs to see a inline function or everything, right? And everything should be context per. So if you context for all the things, you cannot have a source file, right? And, and then with reflection, if you don't have something in source file, you cannot, uh, sorry, in, in the interface, you cannot reflect on it, on it, right? So modern C++ really want to be built from source. But still, we make our code blind, why? Okay, so maybe we don't have access to the source, right? Maybe for legal reason, or maybe you just lost the source for some reason. And this is where you want to use a C, API, right, and the C ABI. Uh, maybe we want to save some memory, right? This was, this was true actually in the IT. Memory was really expensive, so having the same uh, memory, uh, the same DLL uh, loaded twice in memory was not realistic. Uh, but today, memory costs about one cent per one gigabyte, and there is no way we can you can have uh, one gigabyte of executable memory. Uh, so this argument uh, doesn't hold anymore. But maybe uh, C++ is slow to compile, so we don't want to build from source for this question, right? You don't want to be invited to uh, a C++ conference and say that C++, uh, C++ is slow to compile. So, so what we say instead, right, is that C++ has zero cost abstraction, and that is much nicer, right? And but it's actually the same thing, right? We use C++ because we want the compiler to do things more at compile time, so we have less things to do at runtime on our user machine. So it's the same thing. But still, compile time do matter, right? If you don't uh, care, about comp uh, care about compile time, people will uh, forward their classing, even things they don't own. Uh, they will put uh, compile time ahead of correctness, of maintainability, and everything else. So can we improve C++ compile time? A simple solution is to throw more hardware at it, right? That always work. Uh, and in fact, CPU have ever uh, more cores than ever. So you can get better CPU, you can get more memory, uh, and that works, right? And, and maybe we can have faster compiler, right? Uh, but implementers are not uh, magical, so uh, there is, a, you cannot ask too much of implementers. They do an incredible, an incredible job already, sorry. Um, but see, like a few months ago, Microsoft said they improved the, the link, uh, the performance on link.exe by a factor of 5x. So you can actually improve uh, the tool, right? But you don't need to actually build from source every time. Uh, what you can do is build as if from source. What I mean by that is that you should cache as much as possible. Uh, so you can cache transaction unit, right? That was uh, CC cache does, or incredibly done on Windows, I guess. Uh, you can cache interfaces. That's one of the reasons we have module in 20. And there may be other things we can cache, right? Uh, you can maybe cache template instantiation. Uh, there was a project to do that called ZAPTC. Uh, unfortunately, it has been abandoned, but uh, if you cache translation units, you can get uh, a 2x to 5x uh, compile time performance improvements, right? But is that enough? Probably not, right? But there's one simple trick to make C++ compile super fast. Don't compile it, right? I'm going insane, right? Uh, let me explain. Uh, so this is uh, the, Qt, uh, the Qt core library. Uh, so I love Qt, I don't want to pick on them, but uh, they have this library called Qt, Qt core. When something is called core, you should be uh, very cautious about what it is because probably nobody knows, right? 
Uh, but Qtcore does uh, Unicode, it does XML, it does everything, and it's one library. And that means it's, if you want to use it, you have to compile it first, right? And that takes like forever. You just wanted a, a single thing maybe in that library. So to make uh, C++ compile faster, write small library, write small modules that do only one thing, right? Uh, and small library are more easily reusable, maintainable, and composable, right? I don't know if you heard that about like function, but it's exactly the same thing, right? You, library should be logical unit rather than organizational units, right? And another way to say that is don't pay for what you don't use, don't compile what you don't need. Uh, of course, the problem with that is we end up with a lot of libraries and it's really hard to manage. The thing is we don't actually care about library, right? We, we are trying to write a program. So this is what we do today, right? We uh, maybe want to use Qt and Boost, so we need maybe to install libpng from the system. Uh, maybe we need OpenSSL and we like, downloaded that from like, some random WhatsApp on the internet. It's probably fine, right? And maybe we want to use Boost, so we need to compile the Boost build system to be able to compile Boost. And, and that's like maybe two hours, right? And then we write these small programs, which is like 10 kilobytes. And, and so 99% of what we did, we throw away because we don't need, don't need all of that. Um, so what if instead the program decide what library it needs to build and you only build the little bits the program needs? Right? We need to have an inversion of control um, between uh, the program and the library. Right? Uh, so this is something that B2 and QBS uh, could do, right? And I think like Conan and VC package can be configured to be launched from CMake rather than the other way around. And uh, if you have that inversion of control, you can only compile what you need. Okay, so we talk about configuration, we talk about libraries. We need to talk about compile, compiler flags. Right? Compiler flags are hard to manage, right? And 50% of what build system do is unlink compiler flag. Don't, right? Don't have compiler flag in your build system. Compiler flag, uh, you, you need to see compiler flag are basically uh, the equivalent of assembly, right? So, so you should have uh, as little as possible. Uh, when you are trying to make library, a build system for library, uh, you should only express requirements and dependency, right? And you should try to minimize your requirement and be assertive about your dependency. Uh, and if you don't do that, try to get to a, a problem where you cannot resolve your dependency, you get into the diamond problem, your build failed, and you at your life. Uh, so interestingly, uh, Conan has the notion of an option rather than a, a build flag, and uh, Conan can resolve different options and make sure there is no conflict, uh, so it's a higher level than a compiler flag, and it works better. Uh, Bezel just don't let you uh, set compiler flag because that doesn't scale, and, and uh, so they don't do that. Uh, if you uh, want to uh, conf configure your project, you want to use toolchain file. Right? This is where you want to put all of your compiler flag, right? And so a toolchain file, if you don't know, is uh, a file where you set your, your, your flag for your compiler, your linker, uh, but the difference to do that in a toolchain file versus um, a build system is that the toolchain file is under the control of the user rather than the library, right? Uh, so in your build system, you really don't want to have global state, right? Because then you can do you cannot do cross compilation, uh, and it's really brittle. Uh, you shouldn't try to detect the environment. You shouldn't try to be clever in build system. Build system need to be as simple as possible, and don't make assumption about what I'm trying to do. And so you just want to express uh, requirement and dependencies, and you want to avoid a negative requirement, right? Uh, so if you want to express that you don't use exception, maybe the program does, and, and so now your program is UB, and so avoid um, negative requirements. And ask yourself for, for every uh, thing you are trying to do with your build system, is it a property of the tool or a property of the code? And if it's a property of the code, put it in the code rather than the build system. Keep your build system simple, right? Because the problem with compiler flag is everything can be observed from the code, right? It's, uh, the, the interesting question that comes from there is how many uh, C++ programs are on that slide, right? Maybe there's none, right? Maybe this program is not valid. I don't, I'm a tool, I don't know. 
Maybe there is one, right? Let me give you a clue. Okay, so let's see. So let's open IOStream, right? And if you open IOStream, you'll find a couple of if def, right? And that if def may be defined or maybe not, right? And you find another one, and another one, and another one. And all of these nodes on that tree are actually complete IST nodes. And it goes on and on and on, right? Which means uh, in this slide, there are maybe zero or there may be 200, uh, 2 to the power of 500 different C++ program. Maybe they are valid, maybe not, but you don't know you are a tool, right? Which means that if you take some uh, NPM repository and you install something, maybe you have 200 packages, that's complex, right? So NPM is completely terrible. But if you write a new world in C++ that's chaotic, you don't know what's happening, right? And do you test that code, right? Right? If you have that code, uh, I don't know if you saw any of Kate Kroger talk, but I think by, uh, by now as a community, we understand that uh, commented code is bad and we should get rid of it. But what about this code, right? It's still the same, right? It's not executed anywhere. Okay, what I would know? Maybe that's right, but do you have a Commodore 64 to test that code? Is it working? You don't know. And now, is it working? Maybe you never run that code on Linux, so you don't know. Uh, let me show you a more complicated example. So I'm trying to uh, open a file on, uh, in a cross-platform uh, manner. So on, on Windows, I need to uh, use a create file a system function, and maybe on Linux, I use a open uh, physics code, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I think there's a typo on that slide. Uh, let me try to fix it. Oh, so I fix it somewhere, but not other place, right? Because I use clunk tidy, and clunk tidy cannot uh, see uh, the if they have debug because I'm not on debug and maybe cannot see the code on Linux because I'm actually on Windows, right? And there are even more macros in there. So the way we do portability in C++ is uh, by making, uh, by adding code, by adding the code from uh, compiler and tools, right? So portable code is not portable, it's just not there and maybe we cannot actually depend on system programming. Can we do better? Okay, um, there is this uh, bit of uh, wording in the standard uh, that says that uh, outside of a discarded statement, every um, def uh, declaration should be defined exactly once. Uh, a discarded text statement is a if const expert uh, statement. So what I'd like to do is have some kind of if const expert instead of my macros, and that way I can get all of my code in uh, the same IST, and that way I can depend on it. Right? Uh, so the first thing I have to do is uh, define some kind of context per variable depending on whether I'm on Windows or not, right? And I always define this uh, variable, but they have different value on different operating system. And the important thing is that I put that in a module and I put that in namespace so that way my code doesn't conflict with anyone else's, right? And so now I can uh, have that uh, if context per with uh, some sensible um, value in there. Okay, but the, the other issue I have is that on uh, Windows, a health file will return a void star, right? That's what handle is. And on POSIX, uh, open return an int. So I need some kind of way to uh, express that portably. So we can use a uh, std uh, conditional t, right? And I can define my handle type to, my handle type to be that, right? So now I can write that code. Uh, I still have to like define my open and file function, right? So I, I declare that and I put it namespace, modules, same thing, and that like uh, declared in every single OS, right? This is not conditionally compiled. It's declared everywhere, and I compile that file everywhere. I have to uh, take care of uh, constants because everything in C is a macro, a define, uh, so I need to dance around and transform my, my uh, may uh, define into uh, a context variable so I can use it uh, without using macros. Uh, you will notice that uh, I define uh, that, that constant on every operating system, including, uh, including Windows, where I just give it a bogus value because I don't care what it is, right? So that code is again compiled everywhere. Uh, now I need to define my open function, right? I only do that on Linux because it doesn't make sense to do that on Windows. And, but I compile that file everywhere. Uh, on Windows, it just be 
an empty translation in it, right? An empty object file. Okay. And so now my code is fully portable. I don't have macros. You will notice that the module, uh, Win32 and POSIX, are unconditionally imported. And there's no macros everywhere. This code would compile everywhere. And that means that you can actually tool that code. You can go there and rename variable as you please, and you will see all the code paths, right? Okay, we, we can do that in 20, but uh, we could do that in, in the concept TS. Yes. We can, instead of using uh, if const expert statements, maybe we can have a require clause, right? And that start to look strange, strangely like cross, right? So maybe we can learn from that. So, so what I did there is use something I call scalable C. So it's C, but we have modules, we have namespace, we have const expert, so we can actually rely on it. Uh, there is this fun bit of wording in the C standard that says that uh, name starting with two or is a reserve for, for, for C. That means if you have a function that starts with two in your program, uh, it is UB. And that is done because C doesn't have any uh, namespace, so they need to reserve name uh, for future extensions. So all programs are UB, thank you C. Uh, so what you want to do is write dependable interface, right? Uh, so you want to use modules and namespace. Uh, you want to avoid conditional compilation. You want to provide a single interface across all platforms that is always the same, right? You'd, if you really need to use a conditional compilation, uh, you can do that in definition five, right? And, and that's why maybe you can do, we can install the Windows 10 SDK and compile it on Linux, right? It, it might not link, right? Because we don't have the, the uh, system um, symbol, but it will compile, right? So what's a dependency? Maybe a dependency is an, Im an immutable set of definition with an universal name, right? And then a library is a collection of modules with a name, right? So we don't need packages, right? Because we already have library, we already have modules. And at some point you start to even ask yourself, do you even need library? Because maybe modules are sufficient, right? And maybe you can have MeshWip with absolutely no configuration at all. This is an example for Rust, and it's a TLS library. It does the exact same thing as OpenSSL. And that's the entirety of their root script, right? It's 10 lines of code. And half of this line are just description of URL, right? So it's actually five lines, right? So, so if you uh, remove the preprocessor, remove all of the complexity, and, and put all of that just in implementation file and expose unconditional interface, uh, your code because uh, your, your real system can basically melt away, right? Um, a few years ago, uh, Peter Binnell presented uh, a tool called Evoke, and Evoke will just build uh, your project with absolutely zero configuration. It will just look at what uh, include and module you use, and, and then it will uh, get from there. You, we don't need complicated build system in, in most of the time, right? Um, okay, so, so I, talk Java, I talk about JavaScript, I talk about build system, and I went way too fast, I'm sorry. Uh, now I want to talk about politics, right? So I'm, su I'm sure that I will never uh, go there again. Uh, so this is a type uh, of POSIX 8. So it's uh, 84, 85, so it's one year after BRN started to work on, on, on C++, right? And that was developed by Fluio developers. And it's a few thousand line of code, right? And you can actually compile POSIX from source because POSIX is small. And you don't have to care about anything because that step is all there exists in the world, right? There's no internet. You cannot get library from anywhere else. So this step is all you have, right? So you can build it from source and everything works. Um, this is the Google campus. Um, they don't say it anymore, but they have like a few thousand developers, maybe more, I don't know. Uh, they don't say. And they have a quarter million, billion line of code or more. They, they don't say anymore. Right, and that's impressive, right? They, they are able to uh, refactor a quarter billion level code. Uh, so they do that uh, quite great and it's really impressive. So if you zoom out 
right? That's a picture of the NPM repository, right? They have 1 million packages, they have 10 million users, 10 million developers, right? And they download 30 billion packages per day, right? Because the thing is, packet managers are, in effect, giant repositories that span the years, right? When people ask us, we want dependency management, I don't know if they, if they know, but what they want is that, right? And you need that to maintain a common understanding of name and version. When we say, I want to depend on Boothread, when .69, we want everybody on Earth to understand uh, what that is and to be the same everywhere, right? So how can we make 3 million or more de support for developer use the same code base, basically? This is what people are asking for. And unfortunately, to, to make that kind of thing work, we need rules. We don't like rules in C++, but we need them. And maybe the first rule is use the tool, right? I, I'm not saying use one tool, I'm saying use the tool, the only one. And so what we need is a single build system language, right? So we want to use the equivalent of NPM. But the thing is, actually, NPM has been, the NPM client has been implemented many, many times by many different people. Uh, Facebook has Yarn, uh, there are a few others, and there are different clients, but the important thing is uh, they use the same repository, and they use the same protocol, and they use the same description of build system, right? This is what is important. Uh, so we don't have any uh, really great tool, but in the meantime, uh, use VC package, you have Conan and use CMake. Uh, you may have opinion about CMake, but uh, I think it's better that everybody use the same build system, even if it's an imperfect one, rather than trying to invent your own build system. And, and then uh, the only thing we achieve is that there is one more build system in the world, uh, and it has different quicks than CMake, right? Uh, the rule number two is really important, right? Use unique name for module, for library, for name, name spaces. Um, Basically, in, in C20, we have modules. Uh, if two people on Earth decide to call their module core, we break the ecosystem and we cannot fix it. Uh, I don't think like many people realize that. Uh, but if, if you want to have like this kind of dependency management at scale, we really need people to prefix their module name with maybe the company name, uh, maybe your uh, GitHub uh, pseudonym or something. Uh, but right, and put your put your uh, code in. In namespaces, um, don't, don't use using namespace and that kind of thing, right? You want to respect boundaries and scope, and at the same time, you want to give yourself some breathing room, right? If uh, you allow people to uh, put things in your namespace, you cannot change your code anymore. Um, the standard has a document called SD8, and SD8 will tell you uh, what the standard will do in the future, and that tells you that you should not, for example, put things in the standard namespace because that will break uh, your code in the future, uh, is that you should not uh, take the advice of something in the standard library. Uh, so you should go read that document and you should adopt the same kind of policy for, for your code, right? Uh, you, you want also to help um, package a system to, to package your code. Uh, you want to own your, your packaging script, right? So provide packages for your lab own library uh, avoid uh, packaging other people's library. Um, and m most importantly, don't try to modularize other people's library, right? Uh, this is not your code, so don't decide to, to put it in a module that will uh, break in the future, right? Uh, so dependency management is hard, right? But it's not really a true crime. We have all this legacy code, and we have a few options, right? We can keep doing what we've been doing for uh, the last 50 years, right? And maybe that works for you, right? Maybe you are happy with the current situation. Maybe you are happy spending maybe 20% of your time dealing with build system, right? It's something that we all love to do. Uh, maybe you can put every single library under the same under the standard, right? And people are trying to do that with graphic and so forth, right? And if it's in the standard, implementer will somehow find a way to provide that for you. But I mean, neither the committee nor implementer scale, right? We cannot put every library, and it's not realistic. And that's like pushing the limit of what the committee uh, can do. 
maybe we can rewrite everything in Rust or in D or, or whatever, right? And that would be nice, right? But that would cost a few trillion dollars. I don't know if you have that kind of time, that kind of money. Probably not, right? And but maybe we can rewrite uh, some of our tools, and maybe we can adapt some of our code. Maybe we can remove some macros. Maybe we can simplify build system until there is no build system anymore, right? And maybe that would cost a few billions, a few lot of billions at the scale of the planet. But maybe we need to do that at some point if you want C++ to uh, remain successful. It is unlikely that we will. Uh, but if we do, we can get high level of refactoring at scale, right? Because your tool will replace everything because there's no more preprocessor. Maybe we can get code indexing or static analysis. We, we can get cross compilation for free if you don't have any state in our build system anymore, right? Cross compilation should be the default. And we get better ID integration. We can get library and compiler explorer for free because build system are trivial, right? So it's really expensive and really rewarding. Um, I am really sorry I went way too fast. Uh, so that, that's my advice for you. I don't know how I managed to do that in 40 minutes. Uh, so build your code from source. Uh, use module as soon as possible, uh, as much as possible. Uh, write small module, write small library. If you write like a boost module, right? Because people are advocating for boost module. Then I have to build everything from there, so don't do that. Uh, write simple, stateless, build script. Have a compiler fly, use to chain files. And make your code more dependable. I am sorry, this is all I have. I, I don't know how time, uh, I don't know how to manage the time, but yeah. Yeah, so if you have questions and or I need, you need me to clarify something, Hi. Hey. Um, so great talk. I've been saying stuff like this in my company for quite some time. Um, one of the pain points we have is as you write more declarative build instructions, yeah. you simply declare the things you said, like your libraries and your dependencies and such. Um, that pulls certain workflows out of your developers' day-to-day -day, um, work. Like developers expect like a make lint target to be part of the build system, say. Um, and as you pull that logic out of the build scripts, it needs to go somewhere, and there is no off-the-shelf somewhere to put that stuff. So we find ourselves writing yeah. new in-house systems just so that we can understand, say, CMake, and then run the linter against those tools. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, we need to improve in many build systems the toolchain file support. Mm -hmm. But basically, if you think about it, linting is a property of the toolchain, of the toolchain, right? Sure. And, and so you want to have a linting toolchain rather than a lintable code. So if you put that in toolchain file and you have like a lot of toolchain file for maybe you want a toolchain file for uh, UB sanitizer or linting or something like that, uh, you can get this different behavior. Right. And if you don't, if you don't want it. linting, you have, don't have that in toolchain file. Exactly. But the thing is, uh, like CMake has some toolchain file support, but it's, it can be improved, right? Right, yeah, we've done exactly that, but even then, like developers really miss their make lint target or something. Okay, but then you can like right. write like yeah. wrapper script or, right, right. yeah. Right. I, I know that like developer like to have like a key in solution and everything out of the box, but that forces you to put behavior in the build system that you probably don't want in. So I think developer also have to understand a separation of concern at the build system level. And we need to stop making magical tools that work until they don't. It sounds like we're on the same page that like CMake modules that pull in like Git and Clang Tidy and things like that are probably what we want to move away from. Yeah. So great talk. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. Really appreciate everything you had to say. I, I have one question that's more of a clarity question. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I went way too far. Uh, yeah. It's, it's totally fine. It's totally fine. So earlier you said something about um, not letting CMake drive VC package or making sure the VC package drives C. I, I so, didn't quite follow what you said. I was curious what it was. Yeah, so actually, so the way it works actually uh, currently, right? 
uh, you use VC package to install your library. So it's a VC package install library. So you, you say uh, VC package install Zlib. And then in your build system, you use Zlib, right? But the thing, the problem with that is that you are not guaranteed that the environment of your own build system is exactly the same that the uh, environment used by a VC package, right? And you really want a consistent environment. So what you want to do is uh, call VC package install from CMake, right? And that at least can give you more control over the environment. And um, right, you, you need to do that inversion of control, right? And the other thing, if you have like a build system that do like cross compilation, you need to know before on which uh, architecture installed for your Zlib library, whether if like uh, CMake call VC package, it can like tell VC package what, what architecture to compile and you can actually have a different architecture in the same build, right? I don't know if that clarify enough. I think I follow. So you're saying that instead of having like a platform specific build script that would say VC package install and then CMake build, you would have something where you just run CMake and CMake calls VC package yeah, and, and install the libraries. And that, that way you get, uh, you don't have to know in advance what kind of environment you have. And even like if you use some, so VC package will build automatically the debug and uh, release version for you. But if you want to use UB sanitizer, there is no way to do that, right? And you probably want to have UB sanitizer and all your libraries that you're dependent on. And so the way to do that, you need to have a single build tool that drives the build, right? The more, if you have like different build tools that drive the build, uh, they will not be in the same environment, they will not use the same compile, uh, compiler flag, right? So you want to have a single tool that build a library and that, that way you make sure that you have consistency across all of that. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I've had similar thoughts along those lines too that we need the CMake lists to basically resolve dependencies as part of its build process, right? But, but it kind of needs to be, the actual implementation of that needs to be somewhere else. And so you, you mentioned VC package and code. So it, it's the best we have right now, but uh, you don't actually want something to resolve because resolve sounds like you're like trying to be smart and trying to find something. And are you finding the things you think you are looking for, right? So you actually want to download the source and know where the source is and then build that, right? You don't need to, if you find something, you don't really know what it is. So you, you want to do basically what NPM does is to download in dependency repository and build everything that's there when you need it. Right, so yeah, I and, agree. And, right. So, so maybe there's a better word for it than the result. Yeah. The idea is like uh, when you depend on things, you need to find those things so you can build against those things. Yeah. Um, and sometimes your distribution package manager maybe has those already installed and you want to use them. Yeah, but it's, the thing is, are you trying to, when you compile something in, are you trying to compile for like your exact distribution, right? Uh, because people say things like, uh, I want to compile my code for Linux, but Linux doesn't mean anything, right? Because there are like thousands of different Linux distributions and they don't have the same libraries. So you just want to compile the library for your program, which is not the same, same right. flag as the one that is in your well, distribution. I guess in abstract, you're making your own distribution on the fly when you do that. Yeah, basically, yeah, it's basic. You want to compile everything, Statically, right, right. and right. it's what Rust does, and it's what Go does. You everything you need is in your binary, and the only thing from the system you will depend on is maybe the libc, and maybe things right. you really cannot use your own, like uh, OpenGL or something. I guess I guess we can leave that, but I guess my question was more along the lines of you aware of an interface for your build scripts, especially CMake, since you brought that up, that would let you reliably do that without explicitly saying the term, using the phrases VC package or Conan inside so, your build script. So I know that Conan has some experimental support for that, right. where you can actually call Conan from, from CMake and they will make a better job of finding the right flag. And uh, there is no official VC package support for that, but there, are, there is, I think, a project on GitHub. So with a bit of Googling, you should be able to find, uh, to find that thing. I'm told to look at fetch content. Have you tried that? Sorry? I've been told to look at fetch content. Have you tried that? Uh, so fetch content is just really downloading the source, right? right? And then you need to build it. But then the problem with that is that you are bundling your own dependencies. Right. And if someone else does that, 
suddenly you have two copy of whatever dependency you have, like you have to copy a netlib and you cannot resolve uh, your dependency graph because you don't know which, uh, which one of the copy to use. So you advocated for the use of small, simple libraries. Uh, one of the things which seems to happen if you're if you're using those, like in, in NPM space and, and I'm told also in, in the Rust space, is that you have a small application and then you have something like, let's say, five to ten small dependencies and they all have five to ten small dependencies and so on. Yeah, but and, and even when you try to build even the simplest of things, you get three different versions of a unit testing library five different command line parser things and so on, and everything just becomes massively slow. So do you have a, like a, any sort of guidance on how we could avoid that? Yeah. So you, you cannot get in that frame in C++ because uh, Rust lets you have different versions of the same library uh, in a Rust application. Uh, C++ will not let you do that, right? It's like uh, ODR violation and your program is ill-formed and, uh, and you die, right? So, so your build system will not let you do that, right? And what can happen though is that you can, you have like so many constraints on your build system that you cannot resolve it. And then it will be a build system failure. Uh, the way you do that is try to minimize the requirements that you have, which is complicated. And the other thing is that it kind of encourages you to live uh, near Ed, right? And the further you get from Ed, the harder it will get to, um, to add new dependency or to maybe uh, update your code, right? to update just a single library. And I think this is why JavaScript people live always at head and maybe chase uh, the last, the new, la the great new thing, right? So, so there are some issues, but um, at the same time, I don't think that C++ will really get in the same situation as NPM, and I think that Cargo, in most instances, works rather nicely. It's not, there's like no perfect solution, right? And I, I forgot to mention that I mean, I think there's no perfect uh, build system, no perfect packet management, so it's a set of trade-offs. And so, so to clarify, I didn't mean that you have many versions of the same thing, but you but they have one dependency which uses A test, one that uses B test, and with oh, C yeah. test, and so on, so and, and then you have the same functionality implemented okay. in ten different ways. Yeah, and you that, build that's them an all. issue, and that's where if you have like. Some libraries that are used every year, that might be a case where you want to say, okay, maybe you should standardize that, right, and put things in the standard if everybody uh, use them. Uh, it's actually what happened to leftpad, right? It was used by a lot of people and they put it in JavaScript standard library. Uh, and at the same time, I think like people converge to uh, the same solution, like there are the de facto libraries that come on top at some point. It takes time, right? I don't know if that like answer your question, but uh, so it, it seems like you're advocating the reversal of control from the dependency manager and the the, the build system, and then also advocating the use of toolchain files. Yeah. Um, to so, me, so that sounds. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so to me, that sounds like what Conan can do, um, because you can invoke the build system from within Conan with you know, Conan install, Conan build, and it will trigger CMake if you tell it to do CMake, and it will generate CMake files if you need to. And also, the tool chains can be wrapped into the profiles for Conan. So then you can have the tool chains called by the profiles, and then your tool chain or profiles can then have their own dependency. So I can have a unit test dependency or profile, sorry. And then yeah. that, that when I run against that profile, it then includes my unit test if I need it, includes that in the CMake, and builds it all. Yeah, Conan definitely go in the right direction. Okay. So uh, I was just, my question but, but you is, still are, have you, the prime are you not advocating that? or? Are you advocating something different than that? So, so yes, profile, like, the profile are definitely like a nice solution, and it's but it's basically the same as tool, ch tool chain at the package level. So I think maybe Conan uh, will converge to something uh, great at some point. But I think as long as like you can have different build system and different environment, and Conan can do some level of uh, orchestration, but not completely. And oh. same thing for VC package, and you really want a single entity orchestrating all the flag and making sure that you are not doing something uh, nonsensical or with different ABI or something. I would need an example to believe that Conan can't do it, but okay. I, 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 thank you. I guess along the same lines, it seems to me like we have a problem with um, 
the version of control at the library level that we tend to hard code things like OpenSSL instead of just having some sort of abstract encryption interface that we implement. Yeah, so, so one of the big problems we will have in, um, in, in C++ is actually the standard library. Uh, because when I say that uh, dependency management is about um, sharing an understanding of name, when we say I depend on the standard library, what is a standard library, right? Because uh, libc, uh, uh, STDC++ and libc++ and MSVC uh, don't have the same uh, subset of, uh, of definition and don't have the same exact behavior. So it's actually really hard to deal with uh, this kind of uh, meta package that describe one of uh, several possible implementation because it turned out that these implementation are uh, really different. And so when you say you depend on the standard library, maybe you actually want to say that you depend on the optional. And uh, this is like a really uh, difficult question to, to solve right now. And the same thing at the language level, right? I say I depend on C20. What is C20? Because every comp compiler will implement a subset of that and we cannot share an understanding of what that name means. So it's like a really pr difficult problem to solve. Maybe one solution is like um, feature flag. And I guess we, we need to have like, some other libraries are really problematic, like OpenGL. And I, I don't know about uh, OpenSSL exactly, but yeah. I, mean, I was thinking, I agree with that. I was thinking more concretely along the lines of like Rust will have like a serialization interface that could be implemented in one of several ways, for example. Um, whereas in C++, we don't tend to write libraries that are just the interface one would implement if they were to provide a yeah. concrete implementation of something. And so we do see like, you know, test A, test B, test C, test D, instead of just saying, well, this is the test interface. If you want to do it one of N ways, then the program author would pick which one makes sense for the final link and everyone else can just assume yeah. um, there's a concrete implementation later. It seems to me like we don't write libraries like that. Yeah, but I mean, we could write, no. If that proved, proved to be successful, people could start write uh, this kind of interface and maybe have like an implementation. Right. That, that's actually a good idea, I think. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>